Hi guys, welcome to the Winner's Mindset Podcast, and I cannot wait to be joined by my first guest on the Winner's Mindset Podcast, Sam Wardrop. Sam, how are you? Hi, Edward, or Lynchy. Um, <laughs> good, I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me on your podcast, uh, and I feel very honoured to be the first guest, so I'm really looking forward to you know getting stuck into to kind of what it, the, the Winner's mind, Mindset Podcast idea, and sharing with you kind of my journey. Thank you very much, and we're really happy to have you. Um, just before we start, I want to say to the people watching this, um, from me personally, um, Stammer, um, I have my whole life, and one of the things for me be doing this podcast was to me to um, fight it, for me to do what I want, say what I want. Um, for me, my family have been there for me this whole time, my friends, and my speech therapist, and I'm so happy to finally step out of my comfort zone. If you told me I'd be doing this a month ago or two months ago, I'd have laughed at you, but I'm so happy to be doing it now and really come out of my comfort zone and be myself, which is all I want to do. So thank you so much to Sam, firstly, for um, being, being my first guest on here. So thank you, Sam. No worries, no worries, and credit to you. I was, it took me until I was 24, an old man, to, to have the bravery to do a podcast. So uh, fair play to you. Okay, that's really good. So we're going to start off by my first um, thing I say on each of my podcast, which is the winner's mindset. Um, start off by asking you, Sam, how would you define a winner's mindset for yourself? So it's a, it's a really good question. Um, the way I would define it, I think because there's so many different different things in people's lives that they want to be successful in and, and win at, it's quite a, it's quite a big question. Um, but for me, I, I see it as a constant process, you know, being a winner, having a winner's mindset. It's not one thing you do. It's not one moment in your life you become a winner. I think it's a, a, a kind of continuous thing, a consistent thing um, in your life. You know, certain values, certain habits, certain things you do um, can create a winner's mindset. And I think a winner's mindset is something that I work on every single day. And anyone that wants to be successful and, and do well for themselves and they have to be working away um, and I would say working away daily I think that can create a winner's, a winner's mindset. Yeah for sure and for me um, for me one word I always say to myself is now when I'm on my journey to hopefully be a professional footballer or do anything in life is about trusting the process mm. uh, which I've had a lot from you um, being fearful being fearless sorry and what would you say for you are your values what are your f few words that you say to yourself every morning when you wake up okay for me it's like trusting the process <clears throat> never give up what's it for you so the, the one thing i would say that puts a lot of people off and that's put me off from doing things in the past is just being a bit scared a bit nervous of what might happen and um, but one thing i say to myself all the time anytime i fear anytime i feel a bit of fear or i'm a bit nervous or anxious about doing something and um, as i always say to myself what is the worst thing that could happen all right, I always say to myself, what is the worst thing that could happen in this situation? And when you ask yourself that question, if you really think about what the worst thing is that could happen, it's never that bad. You know, so for example, when I was a football player, and we'll get, we'll probably talk, talk about that in a minute, but when I was a football player, say for example, I felt a bit nervous before training, maybe I was going to train with the first team, or maybe I felt a bit nervous before a match. I would say to myself, Sam, what, what is the worst thing that could happen in this game? And the worst thing that could happen is, Okay, maybe I make a mistake. Okay, maybe I make a mistake and it leads to a goal. At the end of the day, that, that isn't that bad. It happens all the time. It happens to every single player in the world. So once you start to realise that, you know, if something goes wrong, a little mistake, when you start to realise it's not the worst thing in the world, it starts to give you a kind of confidence to, to just go, just get, get out there, put yourself out there and do your thing. Is there any times in your life as a player yourself where you've had that, where you've obviously at my age or whenever, where you've played for Celtic or whatever, uh, where you're just a bit nervous, anxious before the training or, or, or whatever, you're trying to, you're, and you're trying to uh, make, every, make everyone happy and you're just mm -hmm. not really that calm. And talk to us about that, you know, those anxious feelings mm -hmm. you had. So I, th I would say, I mean, I think if someone says they don't get nervous, I don't believe them. I think everyone gets nervous. I think it's a natural thing. I think it's a really good thing. I think it shows that you, you care, you know, deeply about what it is you're about to do and I'm the kind of person who 
I get quite nervous and quite anxious about a lot of things in life. So not just football, but generally anything I do, whether it be making videos or um, going on podcasts or um, just a lot of things in life. But I've kind of put things in place um, for myself that I tell myself mentally um, that allows me to calm myself. And quite often when you take, you know, a lot of ner- nervous energy, especially when it comes to a football match or, or a sporting event anyway, if you can kind of control your nervous energy and really kind of channel it into your performance, um, it can actually be of, of benefit to you. Um, but one thing I would say is to anyone who does feel as though they get nervous or anxious, I would say, listen, like you're not alone. Everyone does. Everyone gets that, you know, little feelings of anxiety and, and nervousness. Do you remember, like, is there one player you've shared the, um, the dressing room with that you've said to yourself, like, he's a really captain, he's a leader, and you've learned from um, at Celtic or wherever where you've mm-hmm. really learned from? Mm-hmm. I, I would say, I would say, one hundred percent. I think you know yourself as well that playing football that you get people in your team or you meet people generally that are just natural leaders, and you can tell they, they don't even have to be the loudest person in the room. They don't have to be you know shouting the loudest or always a centre of attention, but they just go around. Go, they go about their business very well. They 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 get really high standards. They do things you know to a really good standard as well, um, and you just know that that you can turn to them, you can rely on them, you can trust them, um, and you know that they'll always be there for be there for you and, and they'll get the job done kind of thing. The one the one player who always, I just thought, was was a leader in terms of, from a football point of view, was uh, Kieran Tierney. Um, so when I was at Celtic, he was, we were obviously a lot younger, you know, we were like 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, that kind of thing. Um, and what I would say... And, and him, you know, any time you trained, any time you played a match, you just knew that he was going to be there like 100%. 100% commitment, 100% energy, 100% effort, 100% intensity. Um, and you just knew that he was someone that you could rely on. He might not have been the loudest in terms of communicating and stuff, but he was just a kind of leader. And I always looked up, although we were the same age and we played in the same team for a long time, I always looked up to, to guys like that because it inspired me to have the same level of standards, if that makes sense. Yeah, when I am play now, um, I'm always looking around me, and I'm quite loud on the pitch myself, but when I look around me, and I've always got competition, I always think. So, obviously, one person that I want, I'm obviously competing for a place with him, or him, or whatever of you, and I'm the captain of my team, and the way I lead my team, and I think, Brendan Rogers, I heard you say mm. the same thing, is that I like to build a connections with them. So I'll have one-on-one chats with them or one-on-one private chats with them. If I see a player making a mistake for not trying, that's when I get mad. But if I see mm. a player making a mistake and I see players, um, of other players moaning at him for um, not maybe giving a pass or making a bad shot, and I never moan at them because I just think they're trying, they're working hard, and that's what you said about there about a tierney, you know. A leader sets an example of how you are to, and that's really interesting to talk about that. Then, yeah, yeah, and I think I think you do get that, Edward. I think you get you get that, and especially football. You know, I, I don't I don't believe that anyone really goes out there on purpose to make a mistake or or do something wrong. And I think I mean, in, in some cases, there might be if someone's been lazy, not pulling their weight. That's when you can have a chat to them and, and have a little go at them because sometimes that is needed. Um, but a lot of the time, pe- people don't mean to ma- ma- make mistakes. Um, and I do see it sometimes, especially in younger players, they'll kind of moan and they'll get on each other's back in, in a way that isn't really constructive and not really helpful. So I think oh, one thing I would don't be that kind of player. Don't be the player that you know moans and moans and moans at his teammates, that kind of thing. I've um, been with those players before and I hated it. Um, but now I'm with a team now that's, you know, really happy and the positive environment's really important. Mm-hmm. I've got really good coaches too. Um, my main coach that I really like is Matt. Um, he's one of my coaches and a little mention to him. And every single time I make a mistake on the pitch, I'm the type of player that will get really wound up about it. Mm-hmm. So it'll be on my mind forever. And I'll just think to myself, why did I do that? Why did I do that? I'll start saying things and he'll just tell me, Lynchy, just listen, just mm-hmm. calm down, do the basics well, relax. And my dad mm-hmm. would tell me that too. I lose my head. And I think it's really important for young players now. When you're around the right team and the right people, that's when you're not afraid to make a mistake. And now I'm not. Mm-hmm. And that's really interesting. 
Um, one question I wanted to ask you, which I heard on one of your um, TikTok videos, actually, is it motivation that drives you or is it discipline? Because you said something um, in there like that, that motivation can only take you so far, mm -hmm. but discipline will take you the furthest. Yeah, I think I think as well it's an interesting point because a lot of a lot of people just think, oh, I don't, I'm not motivated. I don't have the motivation to do this, and um, you know whether it be starting your training program or you know it could be anything in, in their life. And I think you'll have felt it. I, I feel it as well. Sometimes you kind of you wake up and you're excited, you're energized, you've got a fire in your belly, and you want to like you want to do all these things. You've got all this motivation, and for me that goes like that comes and goes pretty fast on a daily basis it can go I can wake up in the morning super motivated and by afternoon I'm like but the thing I think that you, that, that separates um, people you know like winners people who, who really are successful and do really well in anything in their life is not the people that rely on motivation it's the people that rely on I think routines planning structure consistency because those are the things, if you put good routines, good habits, good structures in place in your life, it means that it's easier to do those things. You're not just relying on motivation. So if I only if I only went to the gym or went out to the training pitch or worked on my business in the days I was motivated, it wouldn't it wouldn't go anywhere. Yeah. It's 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 the days where you don't feel motivated, but you still get up, you know, you get the job done, you do the work because you know, like for example, today I wrote myself out a plan for the day. And if I hadn't done that, I'd maybe rely on a bit of motivation to get things done. But because I've got a plan there, because I've got a structure in place, I can commit to it and I can, at the end of the day, look back and go, right, okay, I've, I've done everything I needed to do today. It was a good day. One word you said there, which was um, really interesting, which I say now to myself is planning things out. So having an order in place. So each week you set yourself a target. Okay, I, okay, I want to achieve this or achieve this. And or I want to do this and this, and having that plan in place um, is really important because then it's not actually motivation; it's actually saying to yourself, "Come on, I have I have mm -hmm. this plan, mm -hmm. and I have to and I have to do this." Mm -hmm. um, so planning is the key word. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, for me, I, I basically li I live my life on a plan, and it works really well for me. Not everyone l lives to a plan, and the one thing I would say as to anyone who does make plans is don't make big, grand, massive plans. Like, don't give yourself a hundred things to do that week. Because then you'll end up just getting annoyed. So one thing I do always say is less is better. So not that you don't do certain things, but just tr don't write down, I'm going to do, you know, 10 gym sessions this week. Write down, I'm going to do one, two or three, but I'm going to do them really, really well. That kind of thing. And the other, the other, the other important thing I would say is when it comes to, you know, writing down things or things that you want to achieve, and you might, you might, have, you might have heard me say this before, but a lot of people write down outcome-based things. So for example, Someone might write down, I want to be a footballer by the end of the year. I want to be a professional footballer by the end of the year. Okay, and that's, that's easy to write down. Anyone can write that down. But the thing that I think you should be writing down if you're setting yourself goals for 2022 is what processes and can you put in place, what things can you actually do that would actually help you become a professional footballer? So, for example, you could write down, I need to get fitter. Okay, how do I get fitter? I need to do two or three pitch sessions myself. I need to do some running sessions myself. What can I run in? Okay, I need to work on my sprint stuff. You know what I mean? You get really specific yeah. Yeah. and work, work through the processes and those processes will allow you to achieve um, you know, the outcomes and the goals. Yeah, have um, you worked with Brendan Rogers? am I right saying? I did, yeah. So I was, I was at Celtic when he was there. Um, I was at Celtic for two, I think two years when he was the manager. Yeah, and... I just want to touch on him really quickly with you. Um, I heard you on one of your other ones too. You're talking to him. Um, you're talking, saying about his man management and how mm -hmm. it was world class. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of managers now, obviously, man management, talking to the players, having that relationship with the players, which yep. I do now. Um, would you say that is now really important for managers to do? And you touch on Brendan mm -hmm. Rodgers there. Yeah, I, I think I think it's the I think it's the most important thing. I think if you know how to, especially, for example, Brendan Rodgers, who, you know, world-class manager, he's at a big football club like Celtic, he knows the players can play football. He knows he's got good football players. His job is to really motivate them, to really build a strong, strong team, a really positive environment. And the way to do that is to, you know, build relationships with your players. So don't just see, you know, Sam Wardrop, he's just a football player. He only comes in here to train and play games. You see more than that. You see the full picture of the person. You see, you see them as a, 
you know, as a, a real life human being as opposed to just a, a football player. And I had some I had some interesting conversations with him. And one of the he he's obviously very big on you know mindset and and high high standards. And he, he was he was a big planner as well. Um, I remember when he first came in, he gave everyone uh, at the club a, a book, a kind of almost like not rules, but a kind of guide on how the, the standards that he expected from us and the standards that we should expect from him. And it just showed you like the attention to detail. Um, the high standards he had um, as a as a manager, and it just shows you like the kind of detail he was going into to to really create a real good positive environment. Um, yeah. And as, as I was saying, he, he was big on mindset. And one of the conversations I remember having with him was, I remember he gave the my team a talk one day, and uh, he was going on and on and on. I was thinking that I was like, I, I I remember, I remember, like I remembered what he was saying from something, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And I went home and I had to think, and I realised that he was like he was taking stuff directly from a book that I'd read. So a couple of weeks later, I had a meeting with him. And um, I said, by the way, I said, I need to ask you, did you, have you ever read The Chimp Paradox? And he was like, yes. He was like, it's, I call it my Bible. Um, and so he'd obviously read it. He obviously loved it. And he was taking a lot of ideas from that book and just using it in, in kind of daily life, which I think is really, is really cool as well. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really cool. Um, is there, obviously you touched on Brendan Rodgers there, but in, in terms of young players now in football, um, in England or the places like that. Um, is there any young players now that you think a person like me, a player like me, should look up to in terms of their journey, the way they made it? Um, for me, the person I look up to is Jude Bellingham, um, mm-hmm. one of the players that I look up to um, for me <coughs> because his journey was unique, um, not really playing at a top academy like Man U or you know, places like that, but went through his places and now at 18 years old, had made over 100 appearances and played Champions League football. So is there any young player now that you think, you know, has the full package, really? Um, it's, it's a good question. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting and, and important to, to remind young players that just because if you're 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, even, 20, even 21, but right up to 25, 26, if you, if you aren't playing for, or if you aren't where you thought you would be or where you want to be, like I would say, don't put too much pressure on yourself because as you said there, there's players that, you know, really can come into their own, come into their own game later on uh, in their life, you know, when they, when they do hit their 20s or maybe mid-20s. So I would say don't be put off by not playing in a first team, you know, between the ages of 20, 18 to 22, 23, 24, um, because it, it, can really, it can really change um, and it can change fast. That is the beauty of football. But in terms of players, you know, to look up to, um, I think uh, no, no one, no one springs to mind in particular. If I had to think about it, there would be probably, probably be quite a few. But I think any player who, you know, it's interesting as well. Now you do see more players on social media on on TikTok and Instagram and stuff. But I think players who yeah. that you see who hold themselves well, maybe when they're chatting on camera, um, maybe when they're posting on social media. Um, you know they're doing the right things. I think there is there is a lot of good role models out there for young players to follow. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, I was more, also wanted to talk to you um, also about um, a bit about your journey yourself now. Um, obviously you went through the ranks, um, and you've obviously now quit football. Um, and obviously one of the reasons for that was um, for you to have a break to now work with young players now, working with their fitness, do videos, which is what you wanted to do. Um, is there any advice from your part for players that may be going through a tough time? You know, you have highs and lows in football, which which we all know. How do you cope with those lows in football? Because I heard one quote once where you can't really get too low, but you can't get too high. Mm-hmm. And after a few bad weeks, um, you know, I can get low but you can't get too low, you can't get ahead of yourself when you're too high. So how would you pass on that advice from young players? Mm-hmm. So it's a good point as well. I think I think um, generally everyone's different. Some people, you know, are quite, are, find it easy to kind of just stay in the middle. They never get too high and they never get too low. Whereas other people who do, they get, they get quite high and they get quite low. But I would say one thing, as I would say, if you're not willing to have highs and lows, good times and bad times, then football isn't the sport for you because it is a tough sport. 
you have to be resilient. You have to realise there's going to be really bad days. Um, and you also have to remember there's going to be really good days. So I think if you're a young player, you have to be ready for that. You have to be willing to accept the challenge of that kind of re resilience. You know, when I was when I got my first contract, professional contract at 16, all the way up until I stopped playing at 24, I had loads of highs and loads of lows. And I just think if you ask any football player, that is that is football. That's just the way it is. In terms of dealing with them, on you go, on you go, Edward. That's fine. You, you, you go on. That's fine. So I think I think it's just you have to be you have to be ready and willing to accept that that is that that is going to be the journey through football. You know, until until the day you stop playing, you're going to have highs and lows. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Um, so talk to me about your thoughts when you came to the decision to quit football and go on to this what went through your mind there and what and what was the feelings you know why did you come to that decision mm -hmm. so basically what what happened was i i'd been at celtic since i was 13 years old and all i'd wanted to do all i'd wanted to be was a professional footballer and that's all i really did you know for 10 years of my life that's all i did and then as you know a uh, coronavirus hit so covid hit yeah. and for, for maybe one and a half years, I wasn't playing football because we couldn't play games. You know, we're a bit more luck part of one and a half, two years. And that was the first time that I'd stopped playing football for any length of time, any real length of time. And it gave me time to think. And I started to think, you know, there's actually other things I can, I, I can be doing. You know, there's other things that I actually quite like doing. And I started doing a bit of coaching. I started, I started coaching people. And I realised that, I was getting so much joy, satisfaction, fulfillment from coaching people. And then obviously when the, when the restrictions eased, I went back to playing football and I wasn't quite feeling the same towards it. I wasn't feeling the same rewards. I wasn't feeling as satisfied and fulfilled. And as time went on, my feelings for football, you know, satisfaction, fulfillment were, were dropping and my feelings towards the coaching business that I'd started and uh, making videos, you know, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, that was increasing. Um, and I just I just started to think to myself, you know, if I really enjoy doing something, if I've got a really good sense of satisfaction and fulfillment, then I should I should really lean into that and keep doing it. Um, and it was a hard decision to leave football because it was like my identity. So for ten years, I was a footballer. Like, oh, Sam's a footballer. He's a footballer. You know, that's that's what you're you're kind of labelled as. So it is a big it's a big transition. Imagine if you did anything for 10 years in life, the change is quite tough. Yeah, and I think that's really important now for players themselves. You know, you talked about then just you wanted to feel happy again. You wanted to feel like you, like you wanted to do something you wanted to do, kind of. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, one day I'd love to be a manager one day. To be honest with you, it's, that's one of my dreams too, to coach one day. Player then, but then coach would be one of my dreams. And... Um, it's something that's really interested me. So let's talk to you a bit about now, a bit about n nutrition. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously you s spoke a lot about that. And how important for you is nutrition for a player in football and fitness? Let's just talk about as a, a, a collective. Um, fitness and nutrition. Um, what do you say to a 14, 15-year-old boy um, who wants to be a professional footballer? Mm -hmm. So th the first thing I would say is I think football is changing in that you know, every football player now is obviously a good footballer, but they're athletes, you know. Yeah. Everyone's, like, really fit, really strong, really fast, really powerful. And the way to get to that stage, as you said there, as you, as you touched on, it's it's a big bit of it is your, is your nutrition. And I see nutrition as, like, the foundations of performance. I see, I see nutrition as the foundation of performance. So, see, when you start getting those two things right, it makes everything else a little bit easier. Um so in terms of nutrition for a 14 and 15 year old, you know, first of all, I would say you want to make sure your your diet, what you're putting in your body um, is natural. So don't worry too much about supplements um, at, at, at that age. I think your main focus should be to be getting really good protein sources and varied. So chickens, fish, um, different, different types of meat. I think it's really important to get fruit and veg as much as possible. Um, there's never a limit on how much fruit and veg you can eat. And then obviously good sources of carbs. So not not just like, you know, pasta, white bread, 
um, that kind of thing. You know, good sources, potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, rice is even a pretty good source in your past, is that kind of thing. And um, when you start getting those foundations nailed, um, you'll start to feel a lot better. And it'll really help your development because when you're 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, your body's developing and growing. So you need really good foods to help you uh, in that phase. Yeah, it's really important. Now, I'm obsessed with um, blueberries, raspberries, like them. Oh, yeah, good. Mum, I'm pretending I have packets of them. <laughs> she had to buy loads of blueberries. She, I, can't, I can't imagine she'll be happy with that because they're a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> they are forging over here too. They are. Um, so I want to talk to you also a bit about um, a, a bit about mental health, a bit in in, um, in football, um, and in just like the all round thing, um, mental toughness with yourself too. So in football, you know yourself, you have bad moments. I've talked about. You have lows in football. Um, and is there any time in your life in particular that you think about when you were 14, 15, 16, 17, whatever, where you've been quite low, when you've not really played that well, when you're the... And talk to us how to cope with that a bit. Yeah, so I think um, I definitely have had, you know, low times when I played football, um, especially as a youngster, you know, from the ages of probably when I can first really remember feeling a bit low about football was maybe like 15, 16, 17, just kind of upwards from that age. And it's maybe when you don't have a good game, maybe you aren't picked to play, maybe you're left on the bench. Maybe I remember being at Celtic and there would be times where some of the players would go away abroad and play in a tournament and there'd be, I would sometimes be left out. Um, and it's, it's a hard one to take and you'd feel really low. But the one thing, or two things that I would say that, that really helped me um, one thing was an internal thing that I did. The second thing was an external thing. So the external thing was making sure I had, you know, really good support network around me. So really good friends, really good family. Not not like not like a not loads of friends around me because I don't think you need loads of friends. Just like one or two good ones, maybe two or three good ones, and then obviously family. Um, and I lent on them a lot of the time for support. Um, it's always really good to chat to, you know whoever looks after you maybe if you've got brothers and sisters your mum and dad whatever and then it's also good to, to hear from your mates as well because everyone gives you a different perspective and it can just help you understand things and calm you down so that's externally what i would do internally it's very easy to think oh i can't be bothered with this i'm going to chuck it this is rubbish i'm not going to try hard and um, but one thing i always did was no matter what happened outside I just made sure that I was always, you know, inside my head, I was always, I always stayed focused. So I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a footballer and I knew how, how to get there. So I just kept working hard. So if I didn't get picked for something, if I didn't play, so for example, say there was a match I didn't play. I remember one game I wasn't, I wasn't playing. I was on the bench to full game and it was an evening game. And we came back to the training ground on the bus after the game and everyone was away off home in their car. And I was like, you know what? No, I need to do something. So I went up to the gym and it was winter. So I couldn't go out on the pitch. It was pitch black. So I'm in the gym on, on the treadmill, lifting weights. I'm doing, a, I'm doing a workout just because I know, you know, that's what I need to do. I missed the game. So I need to do some something that day, you know, to keep myself fit and ticking over. So I those are the two things. Like, yeah, um, I am talking to myself about the 1%, which I've heard you also say. Mm -hmm. The 1% that you can get over your competition, it's always just 1%, 1%, 1%. If, if I keep on improving by those 1%, then I know that will you know get me there um i'm really lucky because i've got again i don't have loads and loads of friends i don't go to parties because i have such a great family brother and i've got two or three really good mates that i can play football with talk to and i don't want loads and loads of i've never really been a party person and i won't ever be and people because now the generation is kind of gets parties are not popular um, you can you can get really dragged into that, and I think mm -hmm. I'm obviously between the age of thirteen and fourteen. I've kind of still stayed away from that because of the family I've had, because of the close, you know, friends I've had um, there to talk to. And what do you say about now, young players? You know, I can see loads of young players now, really good players, really good mindset, but just get dragged into maybe the wrong group and the wrong party, really. Mm -hmm. I think, I think about that, wasn't your advice. 
Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point to make. I think it's difficult um, because often, you know, who you surround yourself with will determine kind of where you, where you, the, the kind of like direction that you go in life, who you surround yourself will kind of lead to that. So if you've got people around you who, for example, say you're a football player or a young football player and you want to make it pro, you're working hard, but all, all you constantly hear in this year is, come on, let's go out, let's do this, let's do that. Why are you doing that? You know, for example, like I remember there's probably times where I've mixed with people in the past who would slag me off because I wasn't going out on a night out. They'd be like, why are you not drinking? Or why are you not eating this or doing what we are doing? And I would just say to myself, well, because I, I want to be a footballer and doing those things isn't going to allow me to do that. So I think sometimes, though, you have to maybe experience that type of person or you have to maybe experience going on a night out or doing things maybe wrong sometimes, making some wrong decisions, because then it, it does help you realise sometimes what it is you really want to do and what it is you really want to kind of achieve and focus on. But the one the one quote, Edward, I would say that is really important to me is, I heard it, I can't remember who, who said it, but the guy said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future, which basically means look around you like who, who's who, who's around you what friends and family and if see if they're positive if they're, if they're positive people if they want to do well for themselves quite often that will that'll be the direction you go in as well yeah the positivity is really important and having those people around that you can talk to um you can talk to about your feelings you can talk to about your journey and that share the same um, journey as you and know what it's like is really important um what would you say for you, obviously you read a lot and I've seen a lot of your um, the books and your reading is really important to you and it's important to me too. I've now bought myself three books um, the other day and one of the books is called Fearless and I've been starting to read that and it's really an important thing um, for me is just being fearless. And what about the books that you're reading and why do you think it's important for young players or people that want to be positive? I don't know what happened there. There we go. He's back. <laughs> uh, is that it's still it's still recording on my side, so I think I think I think we should still be good. Yeah, yeah, it's fine then. I, I reckon you might you then. might just have you might just have a a minute or two in the middle of the recording where it's cut off. Yeah. Um, you should you should you should be able to edit though. I think. Yeah, I will be. Yeah, I will be doing that. It says for me that I'm recording. Says. Cool. So I think for me, I find reading really, really helpful and useful. Um, a lot of the books I read are kind of psychology based, self development, self improvement, and I, I take a lot of value from them. I really enjoy reading, but I would say that some people don't like reading. So I think a good option, a good alternative is audio books. You know, you can listen to the, the same book. Yeah. Um, but the one thing I try and do with these books is it's not, I don't try and take every single idea from them. I think if you read something and you can, you can remember one or two good things from it, it's been, it's been a really good investment. It's been a good investment in money and time. Um, and I think it's, it's a, it's a nice way to kind of educate yourself and, and improve yourself. And one of the things I like about reading, so I like doing it in the morning, you know, before really my day starts. And the reason I do that is because sometimes I find them, the books that I choose to read are quite motivational. They're quite inspiring, so it, yeah. it gives me it gives me a nice bit of kind of it gives me a nice wee kick in the morning um, as well. Yeah, for sure. Okay, just just to end off here, I'm just going to ask you a quick five questions. Okay, so mm -hmm. one of my questions is: What are three rules that you set yourself um, to do each? day so maybe be positive or mm -hmm. or like that you know what okay are three rules for you? so three things that i do the three things that i kind of set myself they're kind of loose rules and um, one of them is exercise so i i need to exercise each day um, and and when i do i feel again a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment and um, it allows me to be more productive you know with stuff that I want to do, whether it be a, po a conversation on a podcast or chat to my family or chat to my friends or work on my business. 
So for me, exercising gives me energy. It energizes me, and it also means I'm looking after my body. I'm looking after my health. Another thing is sleep. Like I set myself a pretty, pretty fairly strict rule of going to bed and waking up at the same time, pretty much every day. But don't get me wrong, there are times when things come up, maybe a social event or I'm out of the football or something like that. So I try and stick to it as best I can. And that gives me as well um, that kind of energy that I need throughout the day. And my other one was, I wrote them down, eat well. So eating good foods. So really those three things are, those three things that I do, they allow me to perform in other aspects of my life. I think if you look after yourself first, you can then perform well when it comes to other things in life. Yeah, are there, um, is, is this the next one that have helped you? So in your journey, if you could give three people mention, who would those people be, like your family, your friends, and who would those people be that you would say has really helped you along your journey? Mm -hmm. So I would say my mum and dad would probably be two of them. They're, they're two people who have never, ever put too much pressure on me to to be someone or do something. So for example, they never they never put so much pressure on me to be a footballer. And then when I wanted to change and do something else, they didn't put too much pressure on me to not stop playing football. They didn't say, no, Sam, you can't, you can't, you need to stay playing football. So to them, I think they've, they've been extremely supportive. So having really good support system around me has been good. Um, and to think of a third person, a third per the third person, no one specifically, but I feel like anyone who I've come into contact with who has given me some of their time, you know, whether it be to help me or coach me or explain something to me, whether it be football or business, that would be the third most important person that I've ever kind of came into contact with, people who, who would give you some of their time to really help you. Um, and, and, and I think these people are also quite inspirational as well, if they're willing to do that. Yeah, for sure. Using your three words, how would you describe a person mindset in three words in three words okay so i would say someone that is resilient yep. someone that has a real focus day in day out and also a long-term focus on what they want to do and achieve and the third thing i would say is high standards so high standards in every single thing that you do in life so and looking after yourself and what you eat and how you work out and how you talk to people um, and how you do your schoolwork and how you do your uni work. So just high standards and everything in your life. Because the minute you've got high standards and everything, it's easy to just, you know, change things and also maintain high standards. But the minute you let something slip, it can start to slip into other aspects too. Yeah, what I've learned too is that your journey from when you start your journey to when you end your journey is not going to be like this. It's mm -hmm. never going to be like It's always going to be ups and downs. And that's what I've learned. There's always going to be times where you're like, this is not going well. Do I need mm -hmm. to change the plan? Do I need to reset? Do I need to recharge? And I use this Christmas break because I'll tell you right now, before the, Christ before the Christmas break, um, I was training and I wasn't training well this season at the start of the season and just before the, the break. And I remember feeling coming back from training and I would be so down every single time and I and my mum would ask me, oh, how was training today? I'd be like, you know, it wasn't good again. And it would be every single time. And she knew what the answer would be. And it got to the point where mentally I couldn't handle it. And no one would know, but they could see, like my coach, Matt, as I mentioned to you before, the break coach, and he could see just, he doesn't look right right now. His, his, um, his head's lost a bit. And that's when your confidence drops a bit. And um, the Christmas break, I used the Christmas break to really utilize it and use, utilize my mind doing this podcast now, um, really coming to life out of things, working out a bit more, working hard, focusing on the fitness, focusing on the things that, um, that are valuable to me. And mm -hmm. for me, the one thing that always comes out of mind for me is being positive, mm -hmm. which I'll fair to myself right now is I'm not the most positive person ever, but I'm trying to now be more positive, more happy, more, mm -hmm. more light to myself which mm -hmm. I think is really important. And what you mentioned there about the journey, about the resilience, keeping on trying, 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 creating yeah. plans. And I think that's really important what you mentioned there. But I think, yeah. yeah, no, that's it's a, it's a really good point that you made, Edward. And, and the one thing I would say that, so over the last, you know, 10 years, one thing I can look back on and say with confidence is that 
from the age or from from your age right now, you know, for for the rest of your life, the more experiences you you go out and get. So, for example, the fact that you're doing this podcast, I don't know what else why else you do day to day, but I think the more things that you say yes to, like good things though, positive things, the more you put yourself out there, the more you lean into things that you maybe fear a little bit, as long as they're safe, of course. Um, it's the the more you grow as an individual, the more experiences you have in life, the more you grow as an individual. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing. It's a it's a journey where it's got ups downs, um, but I think the more you experience, it just shapes you into a, a better person. It gives you, you know, a big you know you've got a lot a lot about you um, when you start you know doing different things and experiencing different things. Yeah, um, I just want to say a quick thank you to you, Sam, for um, being my first guest on this podcast, um, and. Um, I'm really happy about it. Um, I can't lie to you. Before this, I was really nervous, um, especially about me, my speech. Um, one thing I have learned is that I won't, you know, when I want to be a coach, when I want play on there, I won't. Um, being being in the way of. Before this, I just sat here for like five minutes and just breathing, but. Because I remember coming out of the um, tunnel, really nervous, but I'm really happy that you be listening. So we'll take it. I just I lost you a little bit there, Edward, towards the end. Yeah, um, as I said, um, I'm really grateful for you. To, um, Yeah, no, Edward, it has been an absolute pleasure. And to be honest with you, um, I would never have guessed that you, if, if you hadn't told me, I would never have guessed you were 14. You're, you're extremely mature for your age and a very good, um, I've been on quite a few podcasts and your questions and the way you, you communicated are beyond your years. So credit to you, mate. I think you'll be very successful um, you know, in, in whatever kind of role you, you, you find yourself in in the future, whether it be coaching or podcasting or whatever kind of, leader um you, you end up being so so thank you for having me on as your first guest thank you very much and um hopefully thank you very much so you guys keep watching